Okay, yes, please. One more. Okay, yeah, yes, please. Still one more, please wait. <laughs> yeah, yes, please. Thank you, everybody. That's right. And secondly, these are always very difficult to see. You have know, to make an effort to see this. Photographs you can... Uh, yeah. Photographs they capture. Yeah.
कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं मेरे साइड में तो वो नहीं
gives me immense pleasure to introduce our strategy guest, Honorable Justice Jeff Emery, distinguished guest, present here to the IIT community. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice. Chief Justice Emery graduated law and joined the bar in the year 1994, 1954, 1955. He was later appointed judge in the city civil special court and in 1974, he took over as secretary of the bar. Two years later, on September 2, 1976, he was appointed as judge in the High Court of Gujarat, in which position he served with distinction to December 1988. In this period, he also worked as chairperson of the advisory board on the conservation of foreign exchange and prevention of smuggling activities in 1974, the advisory board on the prevention of black marketing and maintenance of supplies of essential commodities in 1980, and in the Gujarat State Third Day Commission. He also worked as a member of the Ravi and Vyas Water Disputes Tribunal under the Rajiv Logoval Center. December 1988 saw the elevation of this family in the Supreme Court of India, in which capacity he served distinction in 25th October 1994. During this period, he worked as President of the Supreme Court Legal Aid Committee in the year 1989 and Chairman of the Committee for Legal Aid Scheme in India. On October 25, 1994, he became the Chief Justice of India and had one of the most important leaders of a democratic system, the Supreme Court of India. It is indeed an honor to have you as a person in our midst in this conversation today here at IIM Shantabad. The 90s have been both exciting as well as turbulent times for this great country of ours. Nonetheless, there has been recognition that around 50 years of independent national rule has tested our democratic processes and institutions, and there is international acknowledgement that the foundations of a dynamic democratic ethos have been laid firmly in India. The Indian experience has demonstrated that each and every component of the democratic institutional framework is critical for the effective and critical functioning of the Indian politics. The legislature, the executive, the judiciary, the media, as well as public opinion, have contributed in diverse ways to create the framework of democratic structures and processes. India has also been going through a process of churning on the social as well as economic threats. This has brought the new challenges to confront our democratic institutions. The effectiveness and the efficiency of the judicial system, the speedy justice, alternative food resolution processes, the task of protecting constitutional commitments, the role of reaching out to the needs of disadvantaged and the marginalized, the need for bringing gratitude and righteousness, public and corporate life, are all some of the challenges before the Indian judiciary. Under the able distribution of Honorable Justice Amadi, several stunning initiatives have been taken which are contributing to the restoration of public confidence in the functioning of democratic institutions, functionaries, and processes, initiatives in the area of legal aid for the disadvantaged, restoration of the effective and independent functioning of public institutions, compilation of legal management systems for better accountability, reforms in the legal education systems have been taken up in the recent past. The courage of conviction and the leadership role played by judiciary led by Justice Amity cannot but be a source of inspiration for all other institutions in Indian society. Like other institutions, marriage and education institutions have also been feeling the need for reorienting, restructuring, teaching learning processes in response to catechistic changes which are taking place in the domestic and international environment. I am and the world has not been far behind in introspecting with a view to remain the forefront of management education in this part of the world. The fellow program in management as well as the postgraduate program in management have been renewed during the past three years. Several new courses reflecting the need for developing managers with a global mindset have been offered in the postgraduate program. The placement of the graduates 
as, as usual, the extreme neighbors, that is a major of open school program continues to be received by both domestic as well as international sparkling sector. Our past performance will be served to further strengthen the collective resolve of the Iron and the Bar community to commit itself to the greater enterprise of developing professional managers and corporate leaders of the highest caliber in the goal of excellence in every endeavor. With these few words, sir, let me once again on behalf of society, the Board of Governors, faculty, and the class of 1996, thank you for being with us today. We extend you a warm welcome. The candidates will individually receive their titles from the chairperson as they call their names and return to the front of the dais and remain standing. Mr. Shikesh Krishna. who have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements for the award of the title of the fellow of the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad and request the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad Society to confer the title on them. Thank you. 
తులసి నాయుడు రాజకొండ వెంకట కళ్యాణ్ పీకే ఎల్వి వైద్యనాథ్ మానుష్మి హెగ్డే కేసి వెంకటేష్ కేఎస్ శివరామకృష్ణ ఆదిత్య దేవ్ గుప్తు అమీర్ ఎస్ అమితా మొహంతి అరిజిత్ ఎన్ గుప్తా బాలాజీ ఎన్ భాను ప్రకాష్ ఎన్ హరికుమార్ ఎన్ లక్ష్మీనారాయణ మిశ్ర మచ్చుకం చమయ్ పాని శంకర్ ప్రశాంత్ మింగడే ప్రీత్ సరోజ్ పునీత్ సూరి కురాన్ కుమార్ వాయ్ రాహుల్ దేవ్రన్ రాజీవ్ రాయ్ రీచా ఆనంద్ సౌమ్య చౌదరి శ్రీరామ్ నటరాజన్ సుబ్రాత బోమన్ సునీత్ బుద్ధిరాజ విభాస్ జివానే విక్రమ్ సింగ్ కథానియా అనుదీప్ సింగ్ పురాణ మంజీ రాజశేఖర్ పునీత్ జోహర్ దివ్యజ్యోతి చౌదరి యాశిష్ రహ్యాన్ జాయ్ సర్వాధికారి మహాదేవన్ కృష్ణన్ హర్జీత్ సింగ్ అండ్ గుల్జర్ కాంతా సేనాపతి Mr. Chairperson, I present Mr. Rafael Rahman Kane and 182 others who have been examined and found qualified for the Postgraduate Diploma in Management and request the Indian Institute of Management and the Bad Society to confer the Diploma on them. No. Members of the Society, may the Diploma be conferred on these candidates by the authority given to me, by the Indian Institute of Management and the Bar Society, I confer on you the postgraduate diploma in management and I charge you that in your life, by word and deed, you prove yourselves worthy of it.
The Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad Medal for Scholastic Performance has been awarded to the following postgraduate program students who will come forward as their names are called and receive the medals from the chief guest. Mr. Samir Air Pare. Mr. Bhupendra Singh. Ms. Purva A. Mindrukar. Chairperson, the director, members of the IIA Medical Society, members of the Board of Governors, members of the faculty, graduating students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. To be invited, to deliver the convocation address at one of the premier institutes for management in the Asia-Pacific region is indeed a great honor. I thank Dr. Kanwala and his colleagues for having accorded to me this rare privilege. I am truly overwhelmed by the warmth and generosity with which I have been welcomed today. The issue that I would like to address today is the role that those of you who are graduating today will have to play in the shaping of the immediate future of our society. As you are aware, the Indian economy today is undergoing a process of liberalization which is designed to bring it in harmony with the prevailing trends of globalization followed across the globe. I have told that my immediate predecessors at the previous convocations at your institute were the Prime Minister, Mr. P. V. and the Finance Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, and that in their addresses they had sought to explain the rationale behind the present economic reforms. To have been addressed by the two persons who have been portrayed as the principal architects of the process of economic reforms that are now being implemented must have been an illuminating experience and it must have left you with a fair idea of the challenges before our nation. I would, however, like to add a new dimension to the issue which I think is of import importance for you to bear in mind as you step into the professional streams chosen by you. However, before I do so, let me congratulate the successful candidates, the awardees, 
and all of you who have been honored today on your achievements. We in India are approaching the 50th year of our independence and it is time for us to reappraise the achievements and pitfalls that the world's largest democracy has undergone in a span of time. While we can take a justifiable price in the fact that democracy in India is still vibrant, we have to realize that its functioning has not always helped in achieving the desired objectives. Such an appraisal must also draw comparisons with the achievements of other nations in the same span. I must however caution that attempts at comparison can only be of limited value, for it is doubtful if there is any other nation in the world that has such a diverse social, economic, political, geographical and demographical pattern such as is found in India. Then again, the process of implementing economic reforms is much harder in a developing country that has a huge population wrecked by poverty, illiteracy, and a variety of social afflictions that have a tradition that is dating back to centuries. Yet, we must be alive to the fact that many countries that had achieved independence almost simultaneously with India have gone on to achieve substantial economic progress. The economies of many countries in the East and Southeast Asia are a striking example of this trend. They too have had problems similar to that of India but have achieved greater success in overcoming them. Pandit Ram Jawaharlal Nehru's enduring legacy to our nation is the high standard of democratic values that he instilled in our national character. Those who seek to draw parallels between India and the only other country that can rival it in size and population, China, must not overlook the fact that the economic affluence that the Chinese are said to enjoy has been achieved at the cost of their political and civil rights. It is far more difficult to implement long-ranging reforms through democratic measures which involve meeting the objections of a vast number of groups in society then through an authoritarian instrument. Pandit Nehru's conception of fair socialism may not have met with universal acceptance, but in implementing it, he always strove to adopt democratic means. With the benefit of hindsight, it must, however, be conceded that the concept has proven to be difficult to implement in the peculiar conditions that exist in our society. Although measures to implement liberalization were initiated in the mid-80s, they began to proceed at a steady pace only after we underwent an unprecedented balance of payment crisis in 1991. Since then, a large number of coordinated measures have been introduced at various levels of the economic hierarchy to revitalize our economy. In the true tradition of Indian democracy, these measures have been the subject matter of heated debates. In, in election year, political discussions about long-term reforms are bound to be influenced by the populist proclamations, but the general view of the economic experts is that the process of economic reforms set up 
more than four years ago will continue, although the exact route they follow will be dictated by the policies of the government in power at the center. It would seem, therefore, that reforms oriented towards bringing the Indian economy in harmony with free markets across the globe are here to stay. As we all know, the collapse of the erstwhile USSR along with its economic policy gave a fillip to the concept of the free market economy and soon the countries of the third world were swept away by talks of liberalization, globalization and open market economy. In India too, the 1990s saw, saw a shift from the protectionist or state regulated economic policy to the open market economic policy. The current of the winds of change was strong and there was a pressing demand to shift to the liberal economic policy where the market forces would be the guiding factors. The argument in favor of economic liberalization is that it stimulates development and promises to usually in economic prosperity which would improve the standard of life. Development is a complex phenomenon. Development is intended to secure for all human beings the world over a decent and meaningful life. If development is the means for economic prosperity and consequently the welfare of the human race, can development be divorced from its human and cultural context? Since we are witnessing the universalization and globalization of the economic policy, conceptually, what is the cultural component of such a policy. If development has strong intellectual and moral elements touching individuals and communities, can it be reasonably contended that without the cultural element being a part of the package, the full growth of human personality, which would promise a decent and meaningful existence, would be possible? Culture and development have, in recent times, gained a variety of shapes of meaning, but I view development from two points of view, namely, one, as a process of rapid economic growth related to increased productivity and consequently increase in per capita income, and two, as a process that enhances the quality of life in the sense of greater human freedom which permits development of the human personality. Economic development without human development leaves development incomplete and may therefore truncate the growth of the human being. And when we talk of development, we cannot overlook the cultural aspect which is an integral aspect of the development and growth of the human personality. It has therefore been said that the human and cultural aspects form part of development, understood in the wider context. Development divorced from the human and cultural aspect has therefore been described as growth without a soul. If development is understood in the narrower sense of mere materialistic growth, ignoring the human and cultural aspects, it would be likened to a body without a soul. Poly qualitatively speaking, development is to be, to be complete must comprise both economic development and human development. Obviously, therefore, economic development sans human and cultural development would hinder the full growth of the human personality. Development must therefore be, must therefore not be confined to increased production of goods and services, but 
only, but should also embrace human values and offer opportunities which would permit blossoming of the human personality in all its splendor. When we talk of human and cultural development, the preamble of the Indian Constitution at once comes to mind. It speaks of justice in all its use, social, economic, and political. It talks of liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship. It emphasizes equality of status and opportunity. And lastly, it insists on promoting among the people the sense of fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual human being and unity and integrity of the nation. The chapter on fundamental rights expands these human and cultural values. Viewed in this perspective, can we ever think of development, the horse that is divorced of these values? In recent times, after the conclusion of the Second World War, human rights are widely regarded as an indispensable standard of a civilized society. In fact, how civilized the society is, is determined from the extent of human rights its members are permitted to enjoy. And many of the human rights delineated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights have the same cultural flavor as many of the fundamental rights enshrined in our Constitution. And when I talk of human rights, I am not oblivious to the need to be reminded of the, an individual's duties as a human being towards his fellow human beings as well as the society of which he is a member. Our Constitution also reminds him of his duties by incorporating them in Article 51A by his 42nd Amendment. Suffice it to say that both international covenants as well as Constitution recognizes the importance of social and cultural aspects. Can they then be divorced when we talk of, can they then be ignored when we talk of development? It is then, if then development has two elements, the economic aspect and the human or cultural aspect, the next question is whether there is any correlation between the two. Is development an admixture of both the elements or do they set stand separate in watertight compartments? As pointed out earlier, development addresses increased production and availability of consumer goods and services on the one hand and opportunity to improve the quality of life on the other. But even in the economic aspect of development, if it results in increase in per capita income, it will incidentally have a bearing on the improvement in the quality of human life. Therefore, in the view that emphasizes the economic aspect, there is an element of the human or cultural aspect, even if the percentage is not. In such a situation, the principal or fundamental element is purely economic and the human or cultural aspect is incidental or instrumental. Culture, regardless of its degree, therefore enters as a component of development and cannot be pushed away. The world has witnessed a pressing demand for human measurement, that is, improvement in the quality of life of a human being. Economic prosperity may increase the per capita income of the people, may even improve the standard of living, but it is no guarantee for improvement in the quality of life. It is well known that generation of that money may have improved the economic condition of a family. The per capita income of the members of that family may have substantially increased, but
But if the family has a criminal background, it will continue to have it because culture cannot be purchased by rupees. And therefore, the quality of life will have to be the same, namely, life without values or culture. Culture, therefore, cannot be reduced to a secondary position or to the position of a mere instrumentality to achieve the ultimate goal of economic growth. Therefore, it is important to realize the far-reaching function of culture in development. It is true that by a large, a vast majority of people would value goods and services because of their immediate impact on the daily life of the people. It is difficult to reduce culture to a mere incidental or instrumental role. Culture, as we have noticed, plays a dual role. It plays a subsidiary role in the promotion of economic growth, but when it comes to the growth of the human personality, it plays a vital role in preserving basic, certain basic family values. Therefore, we appreciate the cultural dimension of development. We must bear in mind both its roles, because together they help in achieving the ultimate goal of development in the wider sense. It is therefore obvious that development in the wider sense comprises a fine blending of the economic aspect as well as the cultural aspect. The co-relationship having been established, there can be no doubt that development must comprise the dual aspect of, of culture having implica implications on the lifestyle of the individual as well as the community. Our country has, been, has seen the blending of many, many cultures. Being a multi-religious community, it has over the years absorbed many cultures and is therefore rightly described as multicultural. While pluralism can be a positive factor, it can tend to be risky if lack of tolerance and noise get into an avoidable conflict. We must foster respect for all cultures having tolerant values. If one group tries to interfere or destroy the culture of another group, the composite culture will be affected, which would truncate development. Intolerance on the part of one group could force the other group into a conflict, which in the long run would be injurious to development and the nation. When the world is becoming small, in the course, in course of time, the world community may be required to develop a global culture. Where then is the scope for quarrel amongst ourselves? Viewed in this context, can we say that the revised economic policy pursued by us since 1990s has the right emphasis? I do not propose to dwell on the question whether the revised policy should or should not have been introduced. It can trigger off a lively debate. While accepting the introduction of the revised policy as essential to development, it would seem as if our focus is on foreign investments, essential and mainly to economic aspect with the cultural aspect receding to the background. I feel that both the aspects deserve equal attention, the cultural aspect even more. And therefore, when you go out in the open market and are required to advise people in the corporate sector, these do not undermine the human and cultural aspect. What needs to be realized is that the process of economic reforms <coughs> is not an activity that affects only the economy of the nation. Its repercussions over all other aspects of national life can be profound. A person who emphasizes economic aspect only 
and overlooks the human and cultural aspect would tend to be more theoretical than practical. And experience has shown that mere theoretical knowledge without awareness of the ground realities of the area of operation is not enough to be successful in any project that you may undertake. There is but one more aspect of the process of economic reforms that I would like to comment upon, upon before I conclude. Every one of us present here knows that the biggest obstacles to India's progress are the onerous burdens of poverty and illiteracy that so many of its citizens are forced to bear and live with. Those who propagate the many wonders of globalization and point out to the examples of success stories in other nations must realize that never before has liberalization had to face and overcome such huge horrors as it is confronted with in the Indian economy. The problems that we face cannot be wished away by adopting some magic formula. The adoption of economic reforms as applied in other countries will not automatically do, what, do away with our society's applications. Indeed, such measures will have to be structured in a manner that takes into account the presence of these inhibiting factors and let us try to overcome them. To achieve this end, we need a wholly indigenous system of economic reforms, one that is alive to the peculiar problems of our labor force, the economic inequities, the many social barriers that exist, our specific culture requirements, and so on and so forth. The same is true of principles of management. Managerial principles developed in the best schools in the West would have little or no impact if applied blindly in the Indian context. The Indian cultural ethos is one that has a long tradition, dating back to the centuries, and the Indian economy, too, is steeped in this heritage. Therefore, indigenous systems of management need to be developed to tackle our peculiar problems, and I hope that your institute is sensitive to such approaches. Speaking before you has been a wonderful experience, and I thank you for permitting me to share with you some of my thoughts on tumultuous, tumultuous changes across our country. Thank you for your time. Good luck. God Justice has been one of the foundations of civilization. Take away the institution of justice, and you have no civilization, only the root of the jungle. The deer has no redressal against the tiger, and the tiger none against its human hunter, except the conscience of the human. It is because of justice that the meek and the weak can stand up to the strong, have a chance to develop their potential and contribute their talent and skills to society. 
that personal justice is the root of democracy itself, no taxation without representation. And the judiciary is a chief pillar for siding with political democracies. Justice is also a root of all the great revolutionary movements, ranging from the Reformation in Europe, the French and American revolutions, to the great social upheavals of the 20th century. The institution of justice is, of course, very old. The old law was an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, or worse. But justice has gone beyond the idea of deterrence and restitution to the idea of reform, rehabilitation, fundamental rights, and quality of life through judicial activism. We are honored today in having as our chief guest a person who has embodied in his career this humane conception of justice. Chief Justice Ahmadi is the principal custodian of our judicial system. He took charge at a time when the Indian judicial system had grown greedy. The Indian political system was besieged by corruption and incompetence, and our society was at crossroads. His lordship is a man of compassion and social concern, and he has a sound grasp of excellent judicial management. Fortunately for us, he has a sufficiently long tenure to give the right direction to our judicial system. And indeed, he has taken several steps. Already, the huge backlog of cases in the Supreme Court has shrunk by three quarters. A restrained but essential judicial activism to cleanse the slime is one of his priorities and better management of our expensive and glacially slow justice system is another one. The country looks to him for bold leadership in both these wide areas. IIME is widely considered the best business school in India and one of the best in the world. I said consider. It is probably more difficult to get admission in IIMA than in Harvard Business School. But it is more than just a business school. We believe that high quality management is a key, possibly the key, to a better quality of life. Thus, we need high quality management not only in the business sector, but also in agriculture, public administration, infrastructure, and human capital sectors like education and health. Indeed, in a developing country like India, the business sector itself cannot function well without high quality management of government and various infrastructural and human capital sectors. Thus it is that over the years, besides the business sector, IIMA has got involved in the effective management of agriculture, rural development, energy, transportation, health, education, cooperation, and development administration. IIMA has become a repository of diverse management know-how and know-why. On behalf of the IIMA community, I want to assure the Chief Justice that we will be privileged to provide our expertise in any effort to streamline judicial management in the country. Indeed, indeed, as he knows, an IIMA team has provided some recommendations for more effective judicial management. Over 2,000 years back, Ashoka the Great gave himself the appellation of Devanam Priya, beloved of the gods, for a great mission accomplished well. The learned too are called Saraswati Priya, beloved of the goddess of learning. But in our secular and scientific times, such appellations may raise eyebrows. I shall instead welcome those 
on whom the chairperson has conferred the title of fellow, the highest academic qualification of IIMA, as Medha Priya, beloved of intelligence. May the penetrating and creative power of intelligence be always with you. May you devote your life to discovering and developing those creative insights that enable management to scale peaks of excellence. May the light that pervades the earth, the antariksha, and the heavens continue to illumine your intelligence. I welcome the new PTPs to the portals of management. You are entering a world of work that is significantly different from that your seniors of over five years vintage entered. Our economy has been decisively pointed towards a competitive, globalizing market economy. This is an economy of high risk, but also great and global opportunities. Now the whole world is a stage for your managerial leader. This new economy will reward those with the vision of and passion of an entrepreneur and the skills of a professional manager. In such an economy, textbook learning gets obsolete within the blinking of an eyelash. What such an economy rewards is not so much academic learning as learning how to learn quickly. You will seldom if ever find situations in which the tools and techniques you have learned fit in exactly. The assumptions underlying these tools may not be objective, or the particular corporate culture may not be receptive to employing textbook tools and techniques, or the database for using these tools may not be available, or the cost of using these tools may seem excessive. You will need to harness what you have learned here, but also to improvise context specific solutions constantly. And this calls for a high order of creativity and resourcefulness. You will also need to be creative in exploiting the opportunities afforded by the situation and in raising barriers and constraints. Management is a notion of cross currents. If you can adroitly ride the right current, you can set sail and cross the high seas. If you fail to harness it, you may remain farther bound all your life. You will also need a vision, not just of climbing to a peak position of power and opportunities and riches, but of creating your own distinctive peak of excellence. One last point. There is a difference between excellence and greatness. Excellence is surpassing achievement. Greatness is surpassing contribution. As you steer your young lives towards excellence, I hope you will keep the difference in mind. Excellence is magical, but transient. Greatness is much more durable. It will be worth your while in the mad rush of work ahead to pause sometimes and ask, am I contributing anything worthwhile or simply cashing my talent? At the end of it all, what you will respect most about yourself will not be what you have gained, but what you have given. If your giving is greater than your taking, that surplus will be ample Udashina for your teachers. Farewell.
Thank you.